Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. Tim, welcome to the Exagility podcast. How are you doing today? Hey, John. Thank you. Doing well, thank you. It's always good to take some time out to have a conversation. So to that end, looking forward. Thank you, Tim. So one of the things, Tim, that I was really surprised about was I hadn't heard of you before, maybe two months ago, and it made me realize the power of networks and how important it is that we vibrate each other's networks. And I would be a less significant person than you, but you wouldn't have heard of me either. And you gave a TEDx talk and you wrote at least two books, as far as I understand, possibly even more. <laughs> And the one I'd like to review today would be Mood Set, How to Create a Performance Climate That Inspires Excellence. I read most of the book so far, and I'd like to walk through the book. But before we do that, maybe the audience is in a similar situation, and maybe you haven't vibrated their network either. So would you mind, Tim, just introducing yourself and just give us a little bit of your background, maybe in just less than five minutes, please? Sure, John. Thanks for the opportunity. and. Before I do my intro, very quickly, I agree with you, vibrating our networks and finding other people who are interested in similar topics, subjects, experiences is a passion of mine as well. And it actually requires deliberate focus, doesn't it? Otherwise, as you mentioned, you can discover that there are many people on a similar frequency that you just haven't come across yet. So I agree with that. In terms of an intro to me, I was born in South Africa, 1972. Quite soon after I was born, my parents moved up to what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Southern Africa. I went to school in Southern Africa and I'm very grateful for that. The school system over there is, is based on the old sort of British school system and has retained a lot of the traditions, values and healthy competitive spirit, which I think sets you up tease you up pretty well for life. So I was grateful to go to school in that part of the world. One of the experiences that I talk about in my book, for which I'm grateful, was the opportunity to be head of house of my boarding house at school and the leadership opportunity that afforded me, which I genuinely believe has helped me in my various professional careers and pursuits. What happened at the school I was at, a school called Falcon College, was that a huge amount of responsibility was placed on the shoulders of prefects when you got into your final sixth year at secondary school, to the extent that the staff would step right back and you needed to make real decisions about the development of youngsters coming through secondary school. And I think that awareness and responsibility for young lives and for the performance climate, if you like, within a boarding house. I didn't realize it at the time, but upon reflection later in life was hugely relevant to my philosophy on how organizations, teams, groups need to treat each other and work together in order to achieve a mission. School in Southern Africa, and then towards the end of school, many of my friends were going to university in South Africa or overseas. I was fortunate in that my mother at the time recommended taking a year off before continuing with education. A friend of mine and myself looked into a travel option which was available at the time, which was from Southern Africa across to Australasia, travel there, Southeast Asia, and then over to Europe. It was basically a one-year ticket which you could get and, and which we got. So as an 18 year old, I traveled to Australia and then Singapore, Thailand, and then across to the UK. And that was in 1991, which at the time ended up being a global recession. So pretty difficult to earn money while we were traveling. There weren't many jobs to go around. And I ended up doing things like selling pots and pans door to door, picking tomatoes in a place called Bundaberg on the East coast of Australia. And again, character forming experiences, going from a big fish in a small pond at school to a tiny little tadpole in a massive ocean in terms of life and being out there in the world. It was difficult. It was tough. 
But again, upon reflection, I think it really helped me gain perspective and gain an awareness of the importance of not giving up, of persevering, and going back to something we touched on earlier, building relationships, building, seizing any opportunity that comes your way. Year off traveling after school and to the UK halfway through that year off. I hadn't really thought about the military, but my dad had been at school in the UK. He'd been involved in the cadets. And he said to me, Tim, what are you going to do next year? I wasn't sure. University seemed like the obvious option because my friends were there and I had the A-levels to go to university, but I actually didn't know what I would study if I went there. My dad said to me, what about the British military? You should consider it. I think it would suit your personality, your character, your aspirations. And I'm really grateful to him for doing that. I then pursued a conversation with the British military and actually ended up fairly quickly realizing that the Royal Marines appealed to me because of its toughness and because of the challenge of actually getting in and getting through training and then the opportunities that were afforded you through a career in the Royal Marines. So that's what I did. I had an interview. I then did a potential officers course, Admiralty Interview Board, which is the academic element of selection to start officer training in the Marines and was then in the Royal Marines for eight years. John, or just over eight years, operational experiences in places like Northern Ireland, the former Soviet state of Georgia, West African country of Sierra Leone, when there were problems there, many training exercises in the US and Europe and other parts of the world. And most importantly, having the absolute privilege of leading some exceptional people with whom I'm still in contact and the experience of which I often reference as a benchmark for team building and teamwork and excellence in the face of adversity. So really grateful to that time in the 90s that I was in the Marines. I guess I got to the stage towards my late 20s, eight years in the Marines. Was I going to stay and make it a full career forever? Or was I going to leave? And if so, what was I going to do? And it was a difficult decision because I really enjoyed my time in the Marines. And there was a genuine full career option and opportunity there. But ultimately, I decided to go with the latter, which was to leave. I I've discovered a great transition for me, which was to sign up for a one-year full-time MBA, which I was lucky enough to get onto down in Cape Town, which allowed me to do a number of things. One was to get back to Africa. I was missing Africa. I wanted to go back there. I felt a bit of a calling back to South Africa. Two was to actually get the student experience, which I'd missed out on as a younger man. But three was basically taking a time out to harness my transferable skills from a military background and say, how can I apply those skills in a commercial context in the civilian world? I thought I need to understand what's out there for me and indeed whether I need to qualify myself further in order to pursue a career after the military. So did the MBA year in Cape Town 2001. Of course, as we all know, with September the 11th, 2001, the world changed to some degree at that time. So it was a very interesting time to be changing career and looking around. And what was good about that year was that I realized that my passion for leadership, teamwork, discipline, performance improvement became clearer to me. It was probably latent and arguably drawn on and drawn out in the military anyway. But I realized compared to many of my peers who had done very well in other careers that there's a genuine need for expertise and accountability and support in the space of leadership and teamwork in any environment and very much corporate environments. So I hadn't realized that, but did through that MBA year. I realized that I wanted to get into consulting, coaching, facilitation, helping executive leadership teams and groups from professional teams, from sports teams all the way through to corporate teams, heavy industry teams that I wanted to help them. I didn't know exactly what that help would look like, but I went about reaching out to my network to try and find opportunities to do that facilitation. And basically from 2002 through to 2007, I dabbled in entrepreneurship, small business consultancy to larger organizations to work with their teams, bring some of my experience from my military background in terms of things like practical leadership tasks, integrate those with indoor workshop facilitation. And I continue to qualify myself in that sort of area, John, as I went along. And I was lucky enough to work with feeder squads into the Springbok rugby team through a contact of mine. So that was great. Worked with rugby players and sports teams, and then also worked with 
various corporate teams in different industries between Cape Town, Johannesburg, Namibia. I had the opportunity to develop various signature events along with others to support corporate groups in unlocking their potential, working better as teams, gaining reference points for what good communication and teamwork looks like against different kinds of adversity and different kinds of pressure. And then ideally understand what lessons were drawn from that, take those lessons back to their natural work environment and use that as a stepping stone to get better as teams. In 2007, I met the founder of an organization in Aberdeen, a guy called Ian Mills, who had started a company called Exceed, where I'm at now. And that is a consultancy to the energy sector. It's a wealth management consultancy, but at the time was really very much focused on breakthrough performance and performance improvement for upstream oil and gas teams. And that was a serendipitous chance meeting in Cape Town through a guy that I got paired up with on a coaching exercise on a coaching course. And amazingly, that led to me getting the opportunity to be a performance coach in the heavy industries. So initially diamond dredging offshore Namibia, and then subsequently deep water oil and gas drilling offshore West Africa. And I had the opportunity with Exceed at that stage to literally start from scratch and build up some intellectual property and an approach to helping upstream teams to accelerate their performance improvement as teams, to accelerate their learning, to accelerate their team building in order to deliver against the objectives, which would include quality, time and cost, and indeed delivering a project with high morale, which was an important leading indicator of performance as well. Got married in 2007. My wife and I had two children in South Africa, and then we moved to Aberdeen to help exceed grow in 2012. So I've actually been in Aberdeen for the last 10 years in the role of head of performance improvement as exceed has grown and as we've evolved our service and our value proposition to the upstream energy sector. One point I would make on the family side, John, is that I met my wife, Angela, through work. So like-minded in terms of our interest in working with people. When we looked to start a family, we had some challenges. Life is never just a straight line and straightforward and all plain sailing, as we all know. We had some real challenges getting pregnant and having children, which was really tough. We ended up going down the fertility route and thankfully were able to have children. I look back on that as a formative time. We often make assumptions about how easy it will be to achieve something or to do something. And actually, it can be the things that we're almost taking for granted that provide us with the biggest challenges and the biggest learnings. And so I always reflect on those times where we get humbled, things don't necessarily go our way. And yet how if we actually embrace the challenge, it can genuinely help us grow as human beings. So just a reference point. But I'll stop there because I've been going on for a while. So I'm really curious about what you took away from the Royal Marines, because I noticed in the book that you talked about Cape leadership and you talked about game plan. And so you came out of the Royal Marines, you were trained as an officer, I obviously learned things about how to get high performing teams working really well. And then you did your MBA, I'm not sure what the MBA focused on, it might have been a general MBA, I'm not sure. But how did you join the dots to say, okay, this is how I can help organizations. This is how I can help even sports teams. Because we'll talk about that as well later on to improve their performance. In other words, what was the moment when you realized that actually these team performance, leadership performance, traits and characteristics that you're helping people to gain in the military that you could apply that in other domains as well? I think the answer to that question lies in a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? And I read that book at the end of my MBA year, and the book stresses that you need to identify what you're passionate about in order to decide what you want to do for work. That's the premise of the book. And it caused me to reflect on what I was truly passionate about. And what I was passionate about was sport, for one, and it was leadership number two, and then disciplined teamwork based on background was, was probably a third area of passion. Now, towards the end of my time in the Royal Marines, the England rugby team had come down to the Commando Training Center in Devon in the UK and worked with the Royal Marines to 
enhance their mental skills and their mental toughness. I wasn't involved in that, but I was very aware of it because some of my friends were involved in it. And I also read the reports from the likes of Martin Johnson, Johnny Wilkinson, some of the England stars who went on to lead the England team that won the 2003 Rugby World Cup down in Australia. So I was also aware that there was a genuine value proposition whereby professional sports teams at the highest level saw value in having a breakaway, going away from their normal work environment, working as teams, conducting tasks and reflecting on how to optimize collective endeavor and take those reference points review them, take learnings from them and go back to the work environment to, to deliver better performances. So I read the book, What Colors Your Parachute? I reflected on what professional sports teams in the UK had done with the military concept to get better. And I thought that I could do something similar in South Africa. I then started thinking, well, I need to reach out to the network to find who can put me in touch with professional sports teams. And in fact, that was my first focus, John, was really to try and work with sports teams because I thought I could differentiate in that area. And my background lent itself to working with the mindset of professional sportsmen and women because a professional Marine is not that dissimilar in many respects. It's quite a physical career. It's one which requires teamwork. You can't really get by without being able to work with others. So that, that was probably the, the first part to answer your question. The second part is that I realized that the sports industry, certainly in South Africa, potentially elsewhere as well, and it's quite niche, it's quite small. So from a sustainability perspective, to have a runway of clients and opportunities is not that easy. So I realized that I needed to expand into the corporate world where, you know, that where there was more money and more budget and more organizations looking for help. And so that was probably the second part was leveraging off my experience, supporting some of the feeder squads into the Springbok team and say, hey, look, this is working for professional sports teams. Can I work with corporate teams to also help focus on mission, vision, leadership, teamwork, discipline, objective setting, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that was certainly what yeah, jumped out at me. It does. And I knew you were interested in rugby and you're still interested in CrossFit. But what I didn't realize until I read the book was that you helped provincial and national rugby team, the top rugby teams like the South African rugby team. And so you just hinted at it there a little bit. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Because in terms of helping with performance coaching, OK, you played rugby, but I'm guessing it wasn't about how to play rugby. It was more about how to be as a team. Is that kind of where you went with that? Yes. So a fairly well-known player from the South African side is a guy called Brian Habana, who played over 100 tests for the Springboks and is the leading record holder of tries scored for South Africa. So back in the early 2000s, he was a 19-year-old. and had been identified as a future potential star. And what I was contracted to do was to help young stars like Brian Habana with their mental skills and their mental toughness. So exactly right, John, it wasn't about their rugby skills. I wasn't an expert in coaching rugby skills. I was certainly passionate about rugby, but this was very much focused at taking young potential rugby stars and helping them focus when things go wrong in different environments and helping them build up a set of mental tools and mental skills to deal with adversity in the moment, to stay focused, to maintain a cool head in the heat of battle and to create leadership tasks and challenges which provided a reference point for that and simulated the kind of pressures that they would experience in a rugby match for example, Springboks against the All Blacks, for example. So that was very much the focus of what I was brought in to do with some of these green and gold squads was to train mental skills. And we're talking here about things like communication, concentration. Those are mental skills which you can actually develop through experience, experiential learning. And what we would do was take significant time to reflect after those tasks and challenges reflect, allow the likes of Brian Habana to reflect on what they got out of the exercise and how they could apply that learning 
to match situations. It was a pleasure to work with some of these young guys. Another guy was Farid Dupree, who went on to captain South Africa at the 2015 World Cup. Exceptionally talented young players, but still young adults who were learning how to lead and how to overcome adversity in challenging situations. So that was the value proposition that I was involved in supporting. So I noticed as well that game plan, that must have been the company that you had to do all of this, that it was acquired at some point. Was that the transition to exceed or was there something that happened in between there? Uh, tell us about what happened roughly around that time and what triggered you to, to sell a game plan. Yeah, very good question, John. So coming back to our golden thread of networking, a family contact was referred to me and vice versa. And he was a guy called Steve Blades who ran a company called Elephants in Main Street up in Johannesburg. And he basically provided team building to the corporate world and had been involved in that for a while. And we had a conversation. We were literally referred to each other by friends. We had a conversation. It was at that point that I was realizing that the sports industry, the professional sports industry is quite niche. I was interested in getting into corporate team building. He was already in corporate team building, but he was interested in new approaches to helping teams unlock excellence and unlock their potential. So there was a mutual synergy, a mutual interest from both parties. And we came up with a fairly simple agreement whereby game plans would be integrated into his suite of services in exchange for me taking on the MD role at Elephants in Main Street, learning the ropes in terms of team building for corporate teams and bringing some of the signature events that we developed for game plans or plan your game and applying them, evolving them, and basically switching them to suit corporate organizations. So it was a good fit. It required me to move from Cape Town to Johannesburg. And it was also a time where I met my wife. <laughs> so it was a steep learning curve that time, sort of 2004, 2005. Learned a huge amount then. And also realized that I wanted to get back down to Cape Town. My wife and I, partner at the time, but we decided we wanted to be in Cape Town. And so at that point, we stepped away from Elephants in Main Street and started the Cape Leadership Center. So that was what happened during that time. Cool. And how did the Exceed thing come about then later on? So you got Cape Leadership going. I presume you got good at creating really nice events for teams to get inspired and really see, test people's mentally, but also try to improve the mood, which we're going to get onto really soon. How long did you keep the Cape Leadership going before you moved on to your next thing? Yeah, good question. Through the network and through a friend that I'd met on a coaching course, I signed up to a series of professional coaching courses called Integral Coaching. That was through the Center for Coaching in Cape Town, which was accredited through New Ventures West, which was a San Francisco-based coaching outfit, which in turn was accredited by the International Coaching Federation. Anyway, I was quite keen to qualify myself as a performance and professional coach. So doing a number of courses, met a guy who was working at De Beers had reached recently contracted Exceed, which was a startup at that stage, to help them by bringing transferable learning from the oil and gas industry to the diamond dredging industry in terms of how to optimize utilization of offshore vessels by working with people and process, as well as technology, but more focused on people and process. So the founder of Exceed, a guy called Ian Mills, he was actually in Cape Town setting up that contract and that support. And the guy that I was paired with from De Beers, he had been part of contracting Exceed. So he said, look, there's a guy called Ian from Exceed. He's here. He's looking for coaches to support the scope of work to do to De Beers. Would you be interested? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And I touched earlier, John, on those moments where you need to realize that there's an opportunity and you really need to seize it. I reflect back on, on that as being one of those moments. And I'm really glad that I seized the opportunity, met with Ian, had a couple of meetings actually in Cape Town about my background, my interest in performance coaching, how that had manifested so far, working with different groups, and then understanding his background, which was 
drilling engineer with Shell, BP, and then starting up Exceed as a consultancy because he had more work than one man could do as a subject matter expert in continuous improvement and something called technical limit, achieving the technical limit in the upstream oil and gas environment. So we agreed to work together. The Cape Leadership Center continued for a while because we were based in Cape Town and my wife Angela and I continued to stay in Cape Town while I was starting to work offshore for Exceed, offshore West Africa. So for a while, I was contracting to Exceed. Cape Leadership Center was continuing and that continued for probably five years because from 2007 to 2012, we still had some clients in South Africa through Cape Leadership Center, and I was rotating offshore to various rigs offshore West Africa for Ian and Exceed. And during that time, Ian was asking myself and Ange, who was also involved with Exceed, to move over from South Africa to Scotland to Aberdeen to help Exceed grow. And because we were trying to start a family at that time, we politely declined during those early years. And then after having our first two children and realizing that this was an opportunity we didn't want to pass up, we took the decision to travel from Cape Town over to Aberdeen and settle here for a while. So that's basically what happened. And then as we were leaving, we looked to sell Cape Leadership to anyone who was interested. We didn't manage to make that happen. So we did continue delivering to various clients once we'd moved away with some of the facilitators who were still based in Cape Town and still enjoyed the work. But over time, we basically shut Cape Leadership down and have been now in, in Aberdeen working with Exceed as directors. Anja actually stepped away in 2015, 16, when we had our third child. But I've been a director with Exceed for the last 10 years now. And I noticed in your book as well that you managed to get roped in to be the coach for the P5 rugby team for one of your children. <laughs> I don't know what P5 stands for. What's that? Is that That's a... primary five, primary school. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah. And uh, there was something interesting that I noticed you've been doing already in this interview. You're saying that's about you. You actually mentioned it later on in the book, but I'll reference to it now. But calling people's names, making sure people's names and when there's greetings that people greet each other with their names because that can be a great way to set mood. But also what you said there was call people's names out when people do something right rather than when they're doing something wrong. I thought that was really powerful. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah. I, spot on. Absolutely spot on. I'm glad you noticed that. Uh, it was an epiphany for me during one of the tournaments that I was coaching my son's primary five rugby team through. So there's over four weekends at the end of the rugby season for these youngsters, there are four rugby tournaments in a row. So you have this real opportunity during that month to accelerate the improvement of that group of youngsters. One of the things that myself and a few of the other coaches noticed was it's all too easy and all too tempting to scream at a youngster when he makes a mistake, drops the ball, passes the ball forward, runs out of play, or doesn't seem to have his heart in it. And we noticed that if we gave into that temptation and shouted, all that happened was that the head went down further and performance got increasingly worse. And it was a net negative on all fronts. Whereas what we noticed was that if instead of calling out a name or focusing on when something went wrong, we reinforced when something went right, you could almost see the player grow in size and stature and confidence. A number of things might go wrong. Then he actually makes a good catch, makes a break, gets through a gap, scores a try. Or it's just maybe a really small thing like a tackle when others have been missing tackles. And what we found is we singled out the youngster, and we're talking about 10-year-olds here, called out their name, were very specific about what they'd done. They realized that they were getting positive recognition and getting acknowledged whenever they did something. So the behavior that that encourages is go and do more things to get more positive recognition, to get more intrinsic and extrinsic reward potentially. So yeah, I'm really glad you picked up on that because for me, that applies at any age and in any group. It's trying to identify things that go right 
rather than just focusing on when things go wrong and the impact, the positive impact that can have on a mood, on a climate and on a culture is quite amazing. So one of the things I noticed as well, Tim, is that you refer to this thing called PDP, which I read earlier today and I read a couple of days ago, but it's, it's gone off my mind what that actually stands for. But essentially it was like, like in an immersion week where if you were hiring people, there was a culture within the organization. And one of the things that you mentioned is that organizational culture is something that's difficult to change, but mood is something that we have some control over and it was almost like a, almost like a test in a way, but also a mutual thing, really, in terms of where does the candidate who you're thinking of bringing in, do they suit what's going to go on? Are they going to be like a team player? Are they going to be more like an egomaniac type of person? And is this good for the, a good fit for the organization as well? It seems like a nice idea, and it seems it seems a bit intense. It's unusual. It's the first time I'd heard of that. It's like you're joining the Navy SEALs or something. So tell us how you got to the conclusion. First of all, maybe you could explain the acronym, and then how did you come to the conclusion that this was a good idea, and how long have you been doing it, and what's been your experience been with that type of thing, having an immersion week like that? Oh, that's a brilliant question, and I could talk a lot about this. PCCP stands for Performance Coach Competency Program. We sometimes call it the Performance Engineer Competency Program. So that's that's the first point on the acronym. Just to pick up on your reference to culture, climate, personality, mood, I came across through a friend of mine called Chris Milliner, who runs a company called Performance Climate Systems, this distinction between culture and climate. When I asked him to explain it, he said, culture can be likened to someone's personality. It's quite difficult to change. We're talking about behaviors and that's quite difficult to change in a short space of time. Whereas performance climate is like mood and it can actually be changed in a fairly short space of time if the leaders involved and the people involved choose to change their mood. So with the PCP, the Performance Coach Competency Program, it's something we call one of the longest interviews in the oil field, because when we're looking for performance coaches, it's so important to find the right servant leaders. And the best way to find out if the candidates that are interested have the right approach and for them to establish whether exceed as an organization that they want to work for and through, we put together this incubator, as you say, this one week kind of five day course where we deliberately create a climate in the room during that course. And we help candidates realize the influence and impact that they can have on mood and mood set and the influence that they can have on the energy and the engagement and the emotion in a room. So it's a really fascinating course. And what I like to do with that is in the first two, three hours on the first day of that one week PCP course is to break the ice way more than one might see in any standard workshop or any standard induction. We really encourage each candidate to do an introduction to themselves, much like you asked me to do for this conversation, John, but we encourage everyone to be a bit vulnerable, to reveal more than a few things about themselves that they might feel a little bit uncomfortable about revealing because they typically don't share those kind of things with their colleagues because they might feel uncomfortable about it. They might feel nervous about it. It might be a little bit scary to, to share those things. So we ask everyone to take five minutes before they actually do their introductions around the table. And we say, we're looking for more than you would normally do when you introduce yourself. And what that does, through allowing everyone to be vulnerable, we actually create some psychological safety in the room early on. And it's amazing what that does for unlocking potential and for having honest, authentic growth conversations through the week. So those are some of my thoughts based on your question. and. The result of the evolution of the PCCP and what I've described is finding some exceptional coaches who've gone on to be exceptional servant leaders at the front line in the energy sector for us. They've gone on to 
progress at a significant rate in their own careers because we've helped set them up for success as performance coaches going into some of the challenging environments where they will go by understanding the influence and impact that they can have on the mood of a team on a rig or in a challenging place at the front line. So it's been, it's really been an enjoyable aspect of what I've done over the last five years, I must admit. Thank you, Tim. And there was a lovely one-liner in your book as well. Mood is our inner music. Mood set is the playlist that we create and choose. And then I noticed that in 2020, you came up with a book called Accelerating Automatic. And in there, you came up with a model known as the 3M model. And this is audio, so I tried to do an audio picture for people here. But essentially, imagine there's that there's three kind of oval shapes, two that look like eggs at the top, leaning towards each other, mindset on the left, the performance belief, the way you think, and the egg in the top right hand side being the performance process method, uh, how you actually do the work, maybe lean is in there, six sigma, all those kind of things, whatever you choose yourself. And then you have the overlap between mindset and method, which is discipline, deliberate practice, and an overlap with another oval shape below, which is mood set. So mood set overlapping with mindset and the like, it's giving you a performance climate and the overlap between mindset and mood set is giving us leadership and inspiring excellence and the overlap. And so the overlap between mood set and method had teamwork and basically evoking flow, evolving flow. And I thought that was really cool. That mindset, I often talk about mindset, people criticize it, but I think you're onto something. There's a way of thinking. And I like to talk about behavior set. And I like what you mentioned a while ago, because behaviors are hard to change. You're, you're absolutely right. We know what we need to do, but we don't do it. People who have high blood pressure, they know they need to take their tablets and they don't take them because they feel like they're an old man or woman or whatever, but that's what they need to do. If they want to be a man or woman still yeah yeah uh, it's interesting really interesting in fact there's a lovely book called immunity to change by richard keegan but yeah it's really nice and then you have mood set which is that climate that you're creating so i hear that you have these immersion sessions but in terms of how you come into an organization is it really like a set of facilitated workshops is it some kind of cohort or how does it work if you want to improve the mood set because we can all go to a workshop. You've seen this yourself. You're an experienced guy as well. And people say, rah, 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 they're going to do this, that, and the other. And then they go back to their desk and they're just doing what they always did. So how do you keep that momentum going that if you do make some progress with mood set at the offsite or whatever kind of facilitated workshop, how do you keep that going? What have you noticed, Tim? That's a very good question. Culture is behavior at scale, which is something I got from the Bain consultancy. And I find that a really nice, simple way to help people understand what culture actually is. Now, in terms of climate and mood set, I think the most important thing is to get through to leaders, the importance of their mood on those around them. So in order to enable sustainability, which is what you're talking about, John, beyond the workshop and beyond the brief intervention, how do you enable sustainable change? I think you have to accept that you can't work with everyone on that all the time. It's just unrealistic. So you need to work with leaders. You need to work with key leaders. So it could be department heads, it could be supervisors, superintendents, but if you look at any org chart, it's fairly clear who the key leaders are. So I guess that's the first point is be strategic about targeting those individuals who have the most influence within the organization. Then it's about working with them to help them have some light bulb moments and for the penny to drop and to give them some language and some understanding around their influence on mood set. And so that involves stories. You can help tell stories and give examples. Most people can picture the scene where you as a leader arrive into the work area, the workspace where many of your direct reports are, whether they're sitting at a desk, whether they're working on a factory floor, whether they're working on a rig floor, a drill floor, or whether they're in a virtual workshop where we're looking as you and I are now 
at Faces on a Zoom or a Teams panel, irrespective, you as a leader, everyone's watching you. So they're watching your cues, your energy, your smile. And that's every day of every year that you're involved in an organization. And so if you have had a bad start to the day at home, maybe your car had a flat tire or you had an argument at home. As a leader, it's your responsibility to find a way to transition from that frustration to the realization that your behavior, your cues, your energy, your facial expressions, when you walk into your work environment, the way you do that at the beginning of the working day, or say it's a virtual meeting, the way you come across will literally impact productivity for your team, let alone morale, let alone happiness. But those things are linked. And so you have a responsibility to find a way to separate any frustration that's impacting your own mood and the realization that your mood will set the mood for others. There's a number of ways you touched on workshops. Yes, how do we work? We would typically start by doing some kind of culture or climate assessment or survey, which would ideally be one-on-one -on -one interviews, much like we're having a conversation now, but with key leaders at an organization to build some trust and some rapport. And most importantly, to listen to them about their challenges, frustrations. Now, not only do we need to listen to the leaders, but we need to listen to a diagonal slice of the direct reports and the team members, because they'll counter what we're hearing from the leaders with their perception of the prevailing climate, the prevailing culture at their workplace. So some kind of intake is obviously critical, an assessment, a survey, what's going on. And then we need to analyze that and identify trends, patterns, concerns that we can then target during the next stage, which is leadership alignment. And then subsequently some offsite sessions, breakaways to work with the teams with an aligned leadership group on some key focus areas, which might be communication, it might be process improvement. So you've got to listen first, and then you've got to address the identified challenges. I think our approach is to roll our sleeves up and provide a performance coach who is embedded with the frontline team for a period no less than six months, potentially up to 18 months and longer sometimes, depending on the prevailing culture, the prevailing climate, and how long that's taking to, to change. But we are not one of those consultancies who believes that you can go in, just conduct an analysis, say, here's the report, and then step away. We feel that is unlikely to bring about change because the people responsible for the challenges are unlikely to change unless they have some accountability partnership to hold up a mirror to allow them to reflect regularly on what the issues are and what needs to happen, what they need to do in order to facilitate that change. So there's a readiness period, John, then there's an execution period where we have a coach involved. And then there's a period at which we agree with client leadership teams that the coach can now step away because the tools and the disciplines and the behaviors are now such that we believe they're sustainable and that we've achieved a transformation within the organization. Now, of course, that's all rolled off my tongue in the last five to 10 minutes. It's never that straightforward. Sometimes we see a lot of churn within, say, a rig team. I say churn if you've lost some key leaders, some key supervisors. That makes it quite difficult to step away. Often we as coaches become the continuity because there's so much change at the front line. And in those cases, we would tend to have coaches there for longer because we are the continuity to try and help the team and the new leaders embrace how things are done, the culture, understand mood and mood set, and so that we can set them up for success as well. Those are some insights into the approach that we would take. Thank you. And you give some hints in the book as well about little tips and tricks and how you do that. You mentioned weasel words like can't, need, try, bad. So I guess it's a Yoda from Star Wars is it like there's no try, just do thing. And and what's bad or good anyway, depends on the context. And you can and you can't, it's an opinion, isn't it? So that was interesting. And we mentioned earlier as well about learning names. So that's a game changer for mood set. It's something that is an area for improvement for myself, I have to confess. Me too. And this thing as well is the day language. It's it, it was their fault. It's not my job. I and they, those kind of words rather than we. 
and random acts of kindness, just greeting others, smiling more, listening to understand. And these are all really good things. And you also mentioned zero tolerance for prima donnas and egomaniacs, which ties in a lot with something I've learned before as well, that particularly at leadership level, whatever tolerance we have, for people actually doing the work is sometimes we're depending on really key skills. There's a low tolerance, but some kind of tolerance for people who aren't in the right frame at a doing level, although that depends on the company, the organization, but at a leadership level is zero tolerance, really, if you really want the place to change. And I've seen it so often, Tim, where I make loads of progress with a team. And you mentioned about churn of leadership and then new leader, new broom. And if you're unlucky, you get a command and control leader from hell coming in who actually sets the team backwards. And it's really tricky. And so for me, one of the litmus tests for an organization is, what kind of leaders are you hiring? Are you still hiring for the old ways? Or are you trying to make a difference and consider mood set, I guess, Tim? I guess that's something that you have to deal with as well, right? That you're working with these crews, these teams, uh, people on rigs and sports teams and all sorts of different organizations. And how do you get the organization to build into who they hire, a mood set? I guess the immersion weeks are part of that. What other things have you been trying in relation to that? There's a lot there. One of the things that jumps out at me and I reference in the book is the All Blacks rugby team, who, as it happens, are going through an interesting time at the moment, challenging time, having lost a series to Ireland at home. But the All Blacks have been one of the most successful sports teams of all time. Their success rate is 80-90%, which is pretty phenomenal considering it's a relatively small nation. And one of the aspects of the All Blacks culture and philosophy is something called no dickheads. And what's interesting is when you read up a little bit about that from All Blacks coaches and captains who've been interviewed and who have written books, is that there are many examples of players who were undoubtedly the best in their position in New Zealand, but who didn't play a single game for the All Blacks because their ego was too big. They were serving themselves rather than serving the team. And it was identified that they would not fit into the All Blacks culture. They would have a negative effect, even though they were an extraordinary player. And I think. That All Blacks reference point can be applied to any organization or any crew. If there's an individual who's going to be toxic and is going to poison the culture, the sooner that is addressed and or potentially removed, the better. So I think that's something that needs to be mentioned. And if you can imagine, John, It's bad enough in a crew or a team, as the All Blacks have said, it's that much worse if it's a leader who is an egomaniac and who is toxic. That can be very challenging because often people are tiptoeing around the leader, walking on eggshells because he is the leader. So it's important with the climate assessment process with any organization to lead with courage, which was one of our exceed values, and to out the truth. And a way of doing that objectively as facilitators when you're supporting a team is to make sure that any leaders who have really high ego, potentially somewhat narcissistic, potentially not realizing their negative impact on the prevailing mood, is to literally spell it out for them. So obviously, these assessments are anonymous. However, we can be very clear about the language that people are using to reference leaders and potentially these egotistical individuals who are in charge so that people are aware and hopefully the individual can become aware of their negative impact on the prevailing climate and on productivity and on morale. So I think that's probably a point worth mentioning. But the other thing about coaching is that it can be non-threatening. And so by listening to crew members whilst they're out doing their jobs or whilst they're having a cup of tea during a break, coaches can reflect back to individuals to help them find their own solutions to their own problems, which is the whole essence of coaching actually is 
as distinct from consulting, coaches help teams and individuals unlock their own potential, evoke their own excellence, as opposed to being told what to do to get better so that it's growth from within, improvement from within, and that becomes more self-sustaining and the coach can step away. Whereas consultants coming in and saying, this is what you need to do, and then stepping away, often those crews just go back to doing exactly what they used to do. I don't know if that answers your question, but those were some of my thoughts. It does, yeah, thank you. And just about mood set, you remind me of the training I received from Marshall Goldsmith. He's in the Thinker's 50 kind of a league table of top authors in the managing space. And he was number one a few years in a row and number one exec coach in the world. And he retired. He's not taking on any new clients, but he's still helping people who we already had as clients, really big names. And I learned a lot from him, very humbling. But one of the things he said to me, and this is on YouTube when I interviewed him, that I said to him one day, as change agents, what do we do if, you mentioned this earlier, said, what do we do if things aren't going so well at home or we just, uh, we're just not in the, in the right headspace? And he, he was quite cold of me and he said, it's, uh, you're a professional, you need to uh, suck it up. And he went on to continue. He said, if you're on a Broadway show and you got a, a sore toe, do you say, I can't perform tonight? No, you perform, you're a professional. You, do you say your aunt died last week? No, you don't. You just, uh, you get on with it and you're a professional. And I found this really interesting because who he uses a lot as his kind of reference point is Alan Mulally, former top guy at uh, Boeing and Ford. And uh, Alan Mulally was known for being so happy, sorry, not happy, joyful. He might've been happy, but in terms of, he appeared to be very joyful. Uh, if you ever saw him, he was always smiling. Ford was going through an awful hard time after the 2008 financial crisis. And still you would see Alan smiling no matter what was going on. And what you're talking about, he was getting to people to be vulnerable, to admit that things weren't going as well because all the projects were green, but the company was losing billions. So he's saying it couldn't be green. There's, there's something not right here. And when one person admitted that his project wasn't green, that it was red, Alan applauded the guy for, and now let's talk. Let's see what we can do to get this from being red to green. And instead of the marshmallow, it looks green on the outside, but it's really red on the inside. So Marshall inspired me to really be conscious of my energy and meditation. I could be better at yoga. I could be better at my exercise, but doing my best to try and do what I ever need to do. Even if it's walking in the countryside, going to the mountains, going to the lakes, whatever I need to do to get my energy back, to get my metaphorical Jura cells back up. And because one of the things that I notice is that if I follow your advice and I follow Marshall's, for me, who's a person who wouldn't be very good at playing poker because when I'm cranky, when I'm happy, and which is what you get kind of thing, to act happy a lot of the time, certainly professionally, is draining on my Jura cells. If I don't find a way to get that recharged, I could be in trouble. So it might be just me because of my personality, whatever. Maybe you've come across it with other people as well, some of your clients. How have they managed to balance their authenticity with keeping the mood right so that we perform well as an organization? Yeah, great question. So that's all about self-care. That's about extreme ownership, which is a guy called Jocko Willink, former Navy SEAL, who references his time in Iraq, in Ramadi in 2006. But he's done a TEDx talk and written a number of books, one of which is called Extreme Ownership, which would tie into what Marshall Goldsmith told you and Alam Ali and many of the successful leaders. It's about extreme ownership of your leadership, of your mood. And that, in order to sustain that, touching on your point, John, about authenticity, I completely agree with you. There's nothing worse than seeing someone doing a false smile or pretending to be happy when they're actually very annoyed. So we need to know ourselves. It's that whole thing, know thyself and take the time to refresh, rejuvenate, recharge. It's all about self-care. Put on your own oxygen mask first, as they say on airplanes before you take off during the safety brief. You can't help others if you haven't helped yourself. You can't help your child unless you're breathing in order to help them put their oxygen mask on. And it's the same with organizations. You have to take responsibility as a leader for being energized. Now, that's up to you managing your schedule and managing your time. If you need to go for a walk, as you rightly said, John, if you need to eat at a certain time, if you need to sleep for a certain time, take ownership. That's your responsibility to do what you need to do to show up 
when you need to show up. And that's about being a professional. I really like your point that Marshall made, whether it's on a stage, whether it's leading a team, whether it's on a sports field, wherever it may be, it's up to you to prepare yourself to be the best you can be and to show up as the best version of yourself. And it's about self-care and doing what you need to do to enable that. And you touched earlier when I talk about mood set and talking about your music and your playlist this is something that I got from driving to CrossFit, which I enjoy doing, and listening to playlists that I've put together of music that I find motivating. But also for different examples, you might have a different playlist. But the point is that music is often associated with mood. You hear people say, oh, it was a wonderful mood. The music in the background set the mood for a lovely evening. And actually, that's a real truism. Music that inspires you makes you feel good, makes you feel happy, makes you feel pumped up. There's a reason for that. When we listen to it, it affects our mood. So why not actually deliberately put together a playlist of music that does that for you? All the songs that inspire you, why not have a playlist called Inspiration? And it's also taking that principle to other environments in which we work. And it's saying, okay, what habits whether it's having a cup of coffee, whether it's having a bottle of sparkling water, whatever it might be, maybe it's having some fresh air before you go into the office, whatever it is that you need to do to show up as the best version of yourself most of the time, then do it. It's going to be good for you and it's going to be good for your team. Tim, author of Moodset, How to Create a Performance Climate that Inspires Excellence. Thank you so much, Tim Egan, for coming on the Exeterity Podcast. Absolute pleasure, John. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed it.